got an L for you. You know that, Harry. Get your pounds. Did you get the pounds? Hi, Harry. I wrote a letter. I wrote yeah. a letter. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, no interview after all, I'm afraid, Harry, because <laughs> I have been brought here to say sports presenters will play Murray Carpenter. This is your life. <laughs> He's done me up. They've all done me up. <laughs> oh, we got you. I can't believe it. Yes, and there's a lot of friends waiting back at our sweat-stained studios to do a commentary on your life, so if you get into your little... Track suit, we'll jog back together. That's fantastic. Lovely. Right. Thank, Thank you, you for all your help. Protect her, Harry. This is your life, and you've just reacquainted yourself there with two of the Mrs. Carpenters in your life, your 90-year-old mother, Adelaide, and, of course, your wife, Phyllis. There is a third Mrs. Carpenter, your French daughter-in-law, Bernadette, who lives in France with your son, Clive, an executive with a brandy firm, and from their home in, guess where, Cognac, they greet you now. As you know, I had to leave for the Far East last week on business. Work before pleasure, as you've always taught me. I missed Mother's birthday last week, now this. So I shall just raise a glass to you from far away and say I'm sorry I'm not there, but in my absence I'm sending a small deputation from France. Have a wonderful evening. And here from Cognac, with love, your daughter-in-law Bernadette and your two grandchildren, 11-year-old Aurelie Anne and 4-year-old Timothy. <laughs> they do look very French, don't they? <laughs> so here you are, Harry, surrounded by your family, friends and colleagues, but the gathering would not be complete without your constant little friend. Here, I thought you retired. <laughs> <laughs> yes, your spy partner, Frank Bruno. <laughs> You, you thought that Harry had packed it in, did you? Yeah, I heard rumours in the papers that he was retiring, he's going to eat some frog legs and that, and um, he's, there he was popping up in the ring yeah, with the microphone again. Right. <laughs> we have the evidence of what you've just said because this is the encounter after your European Championship win at Wembley. It was beautiful, very, very beautiful. I didn't think I would see you again, Harry, you know what I mean? I thought you retired from the show, but... No, 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 no you've you got it all wrong. No, no, right. no. You look quite warm there, Frank. Yeah, very warm. <laughs> Let us get the record straight. Have you retired, Frank? No, I don't think so. I'm not too sure what I'm going to do. I hope if I come back, Harry will be there, you know? Beautiful Harry. Oh, I'll be there. <laughs> He's your mascot, really, isn't he? Yeah, it? you can say that. I don't think I can do without him. Pass the sauce, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> and your wife, Laura, is waiting sure. in your corner, then. Thank, you. Thank you very much. I think three of us can get in that suit. <laughs> now, we all know you, Harry, as BBC's voice of boxing, and in more than 40 years at the ringside, you've witnessed the triumphs and the tribulations of a long procession of British champions. 1956 Olympic gold medalists Terry Spinks and Dick McTaggart. 1968 Olympic gold medalist Chris Finnegan. And former world champions Terry Downs. Walter McGowan, Howard Winston, John H. Stracy, Charlie Magri, Lloyd Hunnigan, John Conti, and Alan Minter. And Harry, all those former champions are here for you this evening.
Well, Harry Leonard Carpenter, this is your life, and you weigh in at uh, five and a half pounds on October the 17th, 1925, at South Norwood in London. Apparently <laughs> destined for a career in the city. <laughs> but you are the only son of Billingsgate fish merchant Harry Carpenter, who encourages your early interest in sport while you were a pupil at Selhurst Grammar School in Croydon. Already a daredevil behind the wheel, at the age of 11, your imagination is fired when your father wakes you in the middle of the night to listen to a transatlantic broadcast. It's the heavyweight title fight in 1937. Fire driving Lewis back against the rope, and they're swinging away at each other, and they're going hard at each other. There's a very hard left from far caught Lewis on the side of the head. The crowd are really excited. The crowd are really excited, and they're shooting out. But there, Lewis can't stop far now. Well, that was the Joe Louis, Tommy Farr title fight. Did that broadcast make you think of being a sports commentator? It made me very interested in boxing. Um, funnily enough, I think what made me interested in being a, a sports reporter was a film I saw called Front Page, uh, way back before the war. And I just got the idea that I might just like to be a newspaper man, and particularly in sport. And uh, it all came true, thank goodness. As we shall discover. You were later to meet Joe Louis on many occasions, but it's a four-legged sport that first holds your interest. You leave school at the age of 15 to join the weekly Greyhound Express. Now, what drew you to Greyhound racing, Harry? Well, again, because of my father, who was very interested in dog racing. And uh, a paper came into the house called the Greyhound Express. It's long since gone. And uh, when I left school, I was looking for some job I could get into in newspapers, and it was very difficult. And one day in the Greyhound Express, I saw a little ad which, which said, uh, editorial assistant required for Fleet Street paper. And I thought, well, that sounds about right for me. So I wrote in, and of course, it turned out to be the Greyhound Express itself, which I should have known, but I didn't. And that's where I started. Right, well, after serving in the Navy during the war as a telegrapher on a destroyer, you write about greyhound racing and speedway before landing a job as a boxing reporter with the sporting record. You supplement your income by sub-editing on Saturdays on the Sunday People. And one of your colleagues is later to become your boss at BBC Television. He's now back at the Beeb as Managing Director, Network <laughs> Television, Sir Paul Fox. Well, Harry, we go back a long way to those days of the People when we were both sub-editors on Saturday afternoons. You were a major asset to the subs desk because of your encyclopedic knowledge of sport. Uh, I'm glad that our path crossed again at the BBC when you joined BBC Television as our first boxing commentator. You've done boxing for us, of course. You've done tennis. You've done golf. You've been a master of sports broadcasting. And I salute you for it, and I thank you for it. Uh, have a great night tonight, and I look forward to seeing you again real soon. Thank you, Paul Fox. <laughs> now, in 1949, Harry, you're given two free tickets for the Playhouse Theatre, and you invite your boss's secretary to accompany you. Do you remember what the show was called? I think it was called See How They Run. <laughs> I remember it very well. I, I, we've often said, I mean, if I hadn't had the free tickets, would we ever have got married? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm a mean so-and-so. <laughs> it didn't take you long, though, because a year later you marry and you and Phyllis celebrated your ruby wedding last year. Very true. When you become a, a ringside reporter for the sporting record in 1950, there's a young reporter who's already on the boxing beat with the London Evening News. Your careers have run parallel for more than 40 years, during which you've been keen rivals but close friends. In fact, you are so closely identified with each other that people often get you mixed up. I'm so fed up with people mistaking you for me and me for you that I was hoping this was going to be your retirement party. Here's ITV's voice of boxing, Reg Gutteridge. So people think you are Reg Carpenter, do they? <laughs> Regrettably, yes. I, I was covering a show, I remember, for the Evening News at South London, a little baths hall, minding my own business, and suddenly an uh, old lady came up, well, a fairly old lady, came up and started berating me about something I'd said about her son. And then she started hitting me from behind with an umbrella. And I was saying, hey, hang, hang on, hang on. I just, luckily, she kept missing like her son, apparently. <laughs> and I, I kept this up. 
And she said, yes, you are. You said it on telly. I said, I'm not Harry Carpenter. She said, well, you bloody look like him. She said, you're <laughs> That was before the moustache. That was before the moustache. That's why I grew the moustache. So I'm hoping you'll throw the towel in tonight, Harry, and give me a break for a change. You know what I mean? Thank you very much. Thank you, Reg. Well, although you're most closely associated with boxing, you are a true all-rounder in the commentating world, as another BBC man, Desmond Lynham, reminds us. Hiya, Harry. I'm in the studio that you've occupied many times, like myself, for love of duty and little pay. You've presented Grandstand and Sports Night from here, but of course, you always got time off for good behaviour, to get out to Wimbledon and the major golf tournaments and the big fights, all of which you've covered with consummate professionalism and great style over many years. But um, not everyone will know that in your time, you've been quite a little action man. As Frank would say, take it easy, be lucky, Harry, right? <laughs> you really are. In my opinion, totally treacherous. And how anybody can throw it. Uh, rounded, revving all the time, accelerating all the time. I keep thinking, oh, I thought we were going to hit that tree on the left. It really is like being in a rocket at ground level. Because this terrible tarmac keeps sweeping the water. Oh, God! <laughs> Steering is only one part of Cox's job. He's the boss once the race starts. He watches for mistakes, bullies the laggards, raises morale, and has two stopwatches strapped to his knees so he can time them as well. And now I'll make the final confession. It took me 20 minutes to steer the last two or 300 yards back to shore. In that uh, last clip, Harry, we saw you as a cox with the Oxford crew, but I'm afraid you failed to impress one of the greatest experts. Don't call us, Harry, because we certainly won't be calling you. <laughs> yes, the most successful coach in the history of the boat race, Dan Topolsky. <laughs> Dan, Harry is not going to make it as a cox, then. Well, I think that's, that's a, no, no, no chance at all, actually. I think it would have probably been the longest boat race uh, ever if Harry had been coxing instead more, of commentating. It's more difficult than it looks, I don't know. Well, you'd have probably bounced off every bank all the way to the finish. <laughs> but he's been a great, great uh, uh, benefit to the boat race, and I think uh, everybody reckons that you've won our hearts uh, for all the good work you've done on the boat race over the last quarter of a century, isn't it? That's very kind. Thank yeah. you. Dan Topolsky. <laughs> Now, when you first joined the BBC commentary team in 1949, you combined the job with that of boxing writer reporting for the Daily Mail from 1954 until joining the BBC full-time in 1962. Now, Ian Wooldrich, Sports Writer of the Year, you were a colleague on, on the Mail. Uh, what sort of newspaper man was Harry? Absolutely first class. He had a, a number of attributes. One was he, as you've heard there, he had this broad knowledge of sport and, and could come back and write about it with great humour. That was one thing. The other thing, we had some, some monsters as bosses at the time. Harry always managed to stay calm. It was quite extraordinary. And that was a great lesson to us. And the third thing, I don't want to make him sound a total paragon, but the third thing was Harry had integrity. He didn't write scandal, he doesn't write trash, and he still doesn't. He's a wonderful journalist. Thank you, Ian. You don't have to argue with that, it's all right. Now, in 1966, uh, you make a series on the World Heavyweight Championship and get to meet all your boxing heroes. Now, here's a man you looked up to, the ambling Alp from Italy, <laughs> Primo Carnera. Now, Bob Duncan, you were the producer of the series and the third man in that picture. You set up the photograph. Well, interviewing Da Prim, who was six foot seven, and very nearly one of the tallest heavyweights ever, uh, when we lined Harry up with him, it was a question of looking like that. So we discussed this with the cameraman, went away and got a lens box, put Harry on it, which more or less gave them an eye line, and we both reckoned we'd definitely got Harry on the box. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> it was uh, 28 years ago, Harry, that you first presented the Wimbledon Championships, and you've said that your greatest thrill was seeing Virginia Wade win the centenary singles title in 1977. Now, Virginia takes time off from her tour of the United States to send you this message. Uh. Hello, Harry, and greetings from Connecticut, where I'm dragging my old bones uh, through a Legends tournament. You've been part of the Wimbledon scene for so long, you know you're getting in danger of being, like dear Dan Maskell, part of the furniture. 
Your professionalism as a presenter is something we all admire. But on a more personal note, I would like to thank you for all the kindness and courtesy you've extended to me over the years, both as a competitor and now as a media colleague. We all think the world of you, and you have set standards in front of the camera few can match. Know what I mean, Ari? Sorry, thank you. <laughs> have a super evening. Hope to see you soon. Goodbye, Harry. Thank you, Virginia Wade. Now, Virginia mentioned that you are now as much part of the Wimbledon furniture as this legendary character. So at last, Harry, they've let you out of the bunker. He is not Mr. Wimbledon final for more than 50 years, Dan Maskell. <laughs> Dan, tell us about this bunker. Well, Harry's first 20 years at Wimbledon he was uh, in the BBC studio under court one at Wimbledon, down in the bunker, as we called it. But what I would like to say about Harry is this, that he's one of the nicest men I've ever met. And if I could go to my grave half as good a professional as he is, I'd be a very happy man. Thank you, Dan. Well, during more than 40 years covering major sports events around the world, you've collected enough press passes and tournament tickets to fill a very large golf bag. You were honoured this year with the OBE, and in 1989 you were elected the International Sportscaster of the Year by the American Sportscasters Association. Now, Steve Ryder, Harry has uh, another claim to fame. Well, Harry's made a great contribution to the world of golf, but the achievement of which he's most proud, and it's important that we make mention of it tonight, two holes in one. Now, we've seen him <laughs> presenting the Open, but if this carries on, he's going to be playing in it quite soon. I think, <laughs> I think that's outrageous. Two in one. <laughs> now, uh, you've been presenting the British Open for more than 25 years. One of your most memorable moments came during the dramatic 1970 playoff between Jack Nicholas and Doug Sanders. Let the man who was at your side in the commentary box take up the story. One of the great masters of golf from Orlando, Florida, Arnold Palmer. Hello, Harry Carpenter, and congratulations on this wonderful event that is taking place. I hope you're enjoying it, and I can tell you from this side that all the American professionals that have experienced your commentating are very happy for this honor for you. I hope you enjoy this evening. I hope you've enjoyed your life. I can remember a few times when we worked together and we had some fun. This is your life and I hope you continue to enjoy it. Thank you Arnold Palmer. <laughs> And it seems, Harry, that your all-round ability knows no bounds. You've even sat in as a Radio 2 disc jockey, but your style has not suited all tastes. Do you remember the two elderly members at Dulwich Golf Club who put you in your place, Harry? <laughs> the distinctive tones of golf commentator Peter Alice. <laughs> Peter, tell us this one. Well, Harry did stand in for John, who's about six foot twelve in height, and uh, he was very excited about it, and he did a beautiful job. And he was very flushed with success because, uh, you know, it's a big thing to do the radio, and he went back to his club at Dulwich, and there were two rather senior members at the corner, and they said, oh, Harry, or I might have said Carpenter to him, I don't know, it's Carpenter. rather a posh club, Carpenter, <laughs> heard you on the radio. So Harry's chest puffed up, thinking he was going to get another pat on the back. One of them just moved away and said, hmm, I heard him too. Not quite your scene. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you. Peter. Well, you've made uh, many friends among the boxers whose efforts uh, you've reported. Here you are with uh, Mike Tyson. Now, Terry Lawless. Terry, where are you sitting now? Just here. There you are, Terry. Now, you were with Harry when you first met Tyson, weren't you? Yes, it was in the gym in Canning Town. And, uh when he was introduced to Harry, he became like a star-struck little boy and asked for Harry's autograph. <laughs> <laughs> and it turned out that it, the first book he'd ever read was a book on boxing history that Harry had written. Well, why not let us hear from the man himself? He's on the line now from Las Vegas. Hi, Harry Carpenter, this is Mike Tyson. And I would just like to say it's been great working with you and I always look forward to work with you. You're a class act, you're a gentleman, and I really love you and respect you. You know what I mean, Harry? <laughs> Thank you, Mike Tyson. <laughs> Fun 
Frank, do you get a quid every time anybody says that? <laughs> <laughs> well, tonight's the night. Of all the uh, world heavyweight champions you've met, Harry, there is no doubt which one you consider the greatest personality of them all. You followed his career throughout his world championship campaigning, and here you are together in New York in 1971. Why don't you ever have any doubts of somebody no might doubt. beat you? How can I lose with the stuff I use? <laughs> No doubt. I was a slow, flat-footed, ugly, slow, awkward Joe Frazier gonna whip Muhammad Ali. If he dreamed, he'd better wake up and apologize. But I don't think you let him call you Clay. Didn't I didn't let him call yes, me Clay. He, he called me Clay. Right. I'm gonna stop all of that, too. I'm gonna do them just like I did the rest of them. What's my name? Don't you never my call me that know. no more. That's what I'm gonna do. <laughs> Well, uh, Muhammad Ali would uh, like me to send you his love and best wishes, and he has said, Harry, we've travelled the road for many a mile. I like your style, and I like your smile. All I hope is you've made a pile. <laughs> very moving. Sounds like it. Now, your very first television boxing commentary, Harry, was made in 1949 at an amateur tournament in a factory canteen in Wilsdon. Back in those days, amateur boxing was your major interest, and in 1952, you picked out a 17-year-old ABA light heavyweight champion as the brightest young prospect you had seen. You followed his career closely over the next 20 years, watching him dominate the British heavyweight scene for more than a decade. And you selected this punch as the most memorable you've seen thrown in 50 years of watching the game. <laughs> And he's up at about three, Clay. That was the end of the fourth round, and he hit him about two seconds before the end of the round. Well, nowadays, he's a regular ringside companion of yours on BBC Radio. And tonight, Harry, you're going to be on the receiving end of something I've always wanted to give you for years. It's our Henry Cooper. <laughs> So, Henry, what is it you want to give him? Well, just my heartfelt thanks, Harry, for presenting boxing in such a good light, which you've done over all these past years. You're all a great friend to us, all the, all the old boxing champions and boxing people, and, but we all think you're a champion. Thanks once again, Harry. Harry Carpenter, this is your life. <laughs>